sexual reproduction in flowering plants so you just look at the flowers wonderful creation of god and i see in girls and boys here girls are beautiful and boys at this age adolescent stage i should say you are all very handsome we have flowers another creation of god again very beautiful but very short lived and what what are we going to learn we are just going to learn sexual reproduction in flowering plants the reproductive organ if i go back the reproductive organ in plants they are the flowers flowers are the reproductive organs and i i should say very very short lived but very beautiful and they are the one that give rise to the next generation and going to the sexual reproduction before we go to sexual reproduction understanding the structure of the flower is important so i'm just going with parts of a flower now how do you describe a parts of a flower i will just come to the slide where you can describe the parts of a flower in four words you can describe the parts of the flower in four different words i'm just trying to give you the meaning of the word world it's nothing but concentric circles there are four concentric circle the first one the outermost one the green colored circle the next one you can see the purple colored circle the third one i will imagine the yellow one and the fourth one the innermost green one so these are four concentric circles i'm just introducing the word four worlds of the flower so these are four different worlds of the flower and let us just see one by one let me just go to the structure of the flower so let me just to talk about the first world so the first world of the flower the green colored one the sepals the next world the brightly colored one i'll just put it as petals the third world of the flower let us just go to the male part the stamens the innermost world let us just go to the female part but how do you call the stalk of the flower the stalk of the flower you just call it as pedicel let me just write it as pedicel the stalk of the flower this slide the stalk the pedicel is slightly swollen on top and you just call call this as receptacle either use the word receptacle or you can call it peduncle or you can use the word thalamus so on the thalamus you have all the four worlds so let us just go by one by one the first one let me call it as calyx the first world of the flower i'll use about calyx so calyx is the outermost world calyx comprises of a large number of sepals so calyx is made up of large number of sepals and that's a green part of the flower and that protects the flower in bud condition the second world of the flower let let us let me just give you the name as corolla i'm just introducing the term corolla and corolla is made up of large number of petals corolla has large number of petals corolla is the second world petals are brightly colored they are brightly colored to attract agents of pollination and that this is the second world the third world of the flower and technically introducing a terminology i'm just calling it as andrician so andrician is the third world of the flower and i will call andrician as the male part of the flower andrician is referred as male part of the flower and what is andrician made up of andrician is made up of a large number of stamens so in if you just look at you can just see the stamens here the male part of the flower they are just made up of stamens there are a large number of stamens and this is the male part the third world of the flower the fourth one the first one is calyx the second one corolla the third one andrician the fourth one technically we shall call it as gynecium so this is the innermost world of the flower and gynecium it's made up of either pistil or carpel 
So I'm just going to come into the four different words of the flower. The first one, you call it calyx. Calyx, it's made up of large number of sepals. Sepals are green in color. They protect the flower in bud condition. The second whorl of the flower is the brightly colored one. The brightly colored one is called corolla collectively. They are made up of large number of petals. Petals are brightly colored to attract agents of pollination. The third whorl of the flower is andresium. Andresium is the male part of the flower. It's made up of large number of stamens. And stamens are the male sex organ, which in turn produces the gametes. The innermost whorl, the fourth one, we call it as gynesium. Gynesium is the female part of the flower. And this female part of the flower is made up of pistil or carpel. And this pistil or carpel will produce the female gamete. So I'm just again uh, give, just giving you the details of the four layers, four, four uh, different parts of a flower. So let me just go with the recall the floral diagram. We talk with the outermost whorl. The outermost whorl is nothing but calyx. I'm just, I'm just trying to sum up. So the outermost whorl is calyx. The next whorl of the flower, we just call it corolla. Just introducing the technical terms. The third whorl of the flower, the yellow colored one, we shall use the word andresium. So this is the male part of the flower, andresium. And the innermost whorl, let, let me just call it as gynesium. So these are the four different whorls of the flower. So again, going back to the actual real flower, if I come back to another diagram. So again, the flower looks so beautiful. It has the stalk. You can hold the flower by its stalk. You call it pedicel. The swollen part, you just call it as thalamus, receptacle or peduncle. And on the thalamus, you see the four whorls. The outermost one, you call it calyx. Green colored, protect the flower in bud condition. The second one, you call it corolla, petals. And they're brightly colored to attract agents of pollination. The third whorl of the flower, they're all stamens. The male part of the flower. And they produce the male gamete. The fourth one, innermost one, you just call it gynesium. And it's, it's referred as either pistil or carpal. A pistil or carpal is made up of ovary at the bottom, style and stigma. And inside the ovary, the female gamete is produced. So this, this is the various parts of the flower. Now we go further in understanding the male and female part very clearly. So just now I said the male, male organs, sex organs are referred as the stamens. We just use the word stamen. What is a stamen made up of? A stamen is made up of filament and anther. It has a stalk-like filament and it has an anther. Now what is there inside the anther? There are chambers. I put as anther is bilobed, anther is dithecus, and it produces, it has four microsporangium. It, it produces four micro, it has four microsporangium which produces the pollen grain. So a stamen produces pollen grains. So if you ask me what is a pollen grain, are they the male gamete? The answer is no. Pollen grains are microspores. So I'm just describing the structure of a stamen. It's made up of filament and antho. Antho, if you dehyze it like this and look at the tiny, tiny structures inside, they are pollen grains, the microspores. The microspores in turn will produce the male gamete. You just come to the female part, the carpel. I think I've given you another term. Carpel is called pistil. Either you can say pistil or you can use the word carpel. So what is a pistil or a carpel made up of? A pistil or a carpel has ovary at the bottom, has a style and the stigma. So there is an ovary, there is a style and the stigma. So if you ask me, what is the function of these two? Let us just come back to that later. The ovary inside at the bottom has the ovule. The ovule in turn will produce the female gamete. The egg is inside the ovule. So the pollen grains will give rise to the male gametes. The pollen grain will give rise to the male gamete. 
and the female gamete or the egg is inside the ovule. So this is the male part of the flower and the female part. Taking for granted you've just understood the male and female. I'm just coming to what are the two different type of flower. The flower can be a bisexual one or the flower can be even a unisexual one. We can describe or call flowers either as a bisexual or unisexual flower. Now what do you mean by the word bisexual and unisexual? If both male and female sex organs, if both stamens and the pistil, in case you're going to see both the stamen and the pistil, maybe then you call it a bisexual flower. A bisexual flower is one where the male part and the female part is seen. So the stamens are present, the pistil is also there. The examples, the common examples are the hibiscus and the mustard. Hibiscus and mustard are very good examples of bisexual flower. Hibiscus is one, the shoe flower, China rose you call it. The second one is mustard, both are bisexual one. I'm just coming to the next terminology, the unisexual flower. Only one sex organ is present. It has either the pistil or it has the stamen. In case the pistil alone is present, then you call it a female flower. If stamens are present, then you just call it a male one. How do you name? In case if there is a pistil, I can use the word, it's a pistillate flower. In case you see a pistil, you just call it as a pistillate flower. In case you see stamens, you just call it as staminate flower. Just go with the word pistillate and staminate. So pistillate, the pistil, the female flower, pistil alone is present. Staminate, the stamens are present. So you just call it staminate. So the flowers are unisexual. Only one sex organ, either the female sex organ or the male sex organ. Very good examples are, I will just go with the cucurbita family. So these are very good, papaya is a very good example of unisexual flower. The cucurbit family, they are, they are very good examples for unisexual flower. So, <clears throat> taking for granted, you've just understood. So we have learned, I just, I'm just uh, listing it down. We have learned the structure of the flower. The structure. So I'll just say, we have learned the structure of the flower. And the second one, we have just described very clearly the male and female part. We have described the male and female part. So you're familiar with male and female part. The male part is the stamen, the female part is the pistil or uh, carpel. The third one, beyond this, I think we just have to talk about how will fertilization occur. Initially, pollination should happen. Initially, pollination should happen. I will just go to another slide. So I, I will say pollination should happen. So the, the, this is the process, the third step. After the structure, learning the structure, the pollination should happen. Now exactly I'm just going with the term pollination. So what do you mean by the word pollination? I'm just trying to explain the term pollination. What exactly is pollination? Pollination is transfer of pollen grain from the anther to the stigma. So transfer of pollen grain, and I'll just say these are the anthers. Pollen grains are transferred from the anther to whatever is called a stigma, stigmatic surface. So what is pollination? The transfer of pollen grain from the anther to the stigma, you just call it as pollination. Now what are the two different type of pollination? You can see some aromats here. This clearly tells you there are two different type of pollination. The pollen grain can fall from the anther to the stigma of the same flower. This is one. The second aromat says the pollen grain will fall from the anther to the stigma of an other flower of the same plant. We are just looking at one plant. I will just say this is plant A. So if you just imagine only one plant, plant A, the Stem, the pollen grains are moving from the anther to the stigma of the same flower, A. The second one, pollen grains are moving from the uh, anther to the stigma of an other flower of the same plant. 
the plantus plantae there's no difference there is a third third type a third aroma there is a there is b the third one the pollen grains are transferred from the anther to the stigma of an other plant i will just call it plant b so it's moving to an other plant so th this is the third category so pollination can be either a type b type or c so what is a transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of the same flower what is b transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of an other flower of the same plant what is c transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of another flower of another plant of the same species so there are three i i i should say a and b i will call a and b as self pollination so what is a and what is b i will use the word a and b are self pollination now what c i just go with the word c c is nothing but its cross pollination c is nothing but its cross pollination so their pollination is of three types it can be self it can be cross now what is self transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of the same flower or another flower of the same plant what is cross transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma of another flower of an other plant of the same species i have used the word self and cross now i'm just asking you what's the difference between self and cross i think i've just summarized here so whatever i said the pollen grains from the flower are carried to the stigma of the same that self and the pollen grains are carried to the stigma of an other different flower on on an other plant so this is what we have learnt so that's cross and here for self to occur there's no requirement of an agent an agent is not required for cross to occur definitely some agents are required so what's the difference between self and cross so self there's no no necessity for an agent cross it's a must and self is preferable self is preferable just because it can maintain it pure lines homozygous condition cross definitely will bring about variations and variations are the necessity for evolution to occur so there now now again the term agent is something new on the slide so i'm just trying to explain what do you mean by an agent which causes pollination so i'm just coming back to the agent so if i look at this i'll say this is an agent this is an agent which causes pollination to occur so this is just coming and sitting on the flower carrying the pollen grains from one flower i'll just put it as to another flower of the same type it can go to the same type it can go to the different type but pollination will occur only when it visits same similar kind of flower on another plant so this is an agent i i would like to give a name to this agent i will call it as biotic agent this is something living it's living very much like you and me i'm sure this is biotic agent i shall call this as a biotic agent which brings about pollination an agent which brings about pollination it's a biotic agent so now let, let me just classify what are the various agents causing pollination pollination can be either self or cross it can be a self pollination it can be cross pollination if it is self it can be within the same flower or it can be on an other flower other flower of the same plant technically self pollination can be autogamy the cross pollination is gametogamy cross pollination we call it as xenogamy for self to occur definitely no agents are required no agents are required whereas for the cross definitely agents are required some agent ha has to bring the poll pollination so what are the pollinating agents it can be either abiotic or it can be biotic so the words are self explanatory what do you mean by abiotic and biotic the word abiotic says they are non living whereas the biotic says very much they are living these are the living agents which can bring about these are the non living agents 
which can still bring about pollination. Now, what are the non-living agents? I'll say wind is one and the second one is water. Wind and water will carry a lot of pollen grains. I'm sure in case whenever a wind blows, sometimes you can see it looks like a sulfur rain. Where, wherever there is a lot of pollen grain, wherever there's a pine garden, when the wind blows, it looks like sulfur rain. The wind is carrying such a lot of pollen grain. So we say it's wind pollination. Water, the coconut trees which go, grow by the side of water, maybe again, okay, there it is, see this person. Okay, I'm just coming back. So this is water pollination. So the plants which are in water, for example, Vallisneria. So the pollination is by water. Water, the waves will carry the pollen grains. So wind and water, abiotic agents. Whereas biotic, I'll put as snails can bring about, insects can bring about, birds can bring about, bat can bring about, why not even man? We ourselves can bring about pollination. When we go amidst flowers, the pollen grain can stick on and you can transfer it. Any vertebrate animal, anything can bring about. So I'm just going with snail. The insect, insect is very common. Bee pollination is very common. Bird, ornithophily, again that's quite common. Bat, wherever bats are there, definitely pollination is possible. Vertebrate, any vertebrate animal can bring about pollination. So we're just talking about agents that cause pollination or agents that bring about pollination. One important phenomenon without which fertilization cannot occur. And who is bringing about pollination? It is either uh, abiotic, the non-living agents or the biotic ones, the living organism. So I just want you to understand what is self, what's cross-pollination and what are the agents which bring about cross-pollination. Agents are required only for cross and we say there are two abiotic and there are biotic. If we ask you one simple question, wherever I sit, wind pollination, it looks like sulfur rain. So the number of pollen grains produced in wind pollination is really great. Can you just give me answer why so much pollen grains are produced? in plants where wind pollination is carried out. I'm putting one question, maybe I'll just wait to hear from you, even towards the end. Why a large amount of pollen grains are produced wherever the pollinating agent is abiotic agent, either wind or water. If it is biotic, the number of pollen grains produced compared to this is always lesser. So this is one phenomenon which is very important for the next step to occur. The next step I should say it's fertilization. So the next step, I think my slides, okay. So this is after pollination. Immediately, I said first one, we have learned the structure of the flower. We have just learned the male and female part thoroughly. We have just gone with one important phenomenon, which is important and that's pollination. And the most important one, I just call it as fertilization. The most important phenomenon, which brings a which is required for a new organism to come up. I just call it fertilization. So this is the term which is really important, fertilizing. Survival of any species, existence of any organism, I put it as fertilization is very, very important. And sexual reproduction, I put it as it brings about variation. Evolution will occur and it's there almost in higher organism. Now the word, what's double fertilization? Why do you call it double? Generally, I said fertilization word is very important. We are using the word double fertilization. So a, a small thought on the word, why is it double? Why do you call it double? So now again, I, I'm just coming back to fertilization. By the end, I'll make you understand what's double fertilization. So pollen grains are on the stigmatic surface. What do you call the phenomenon? Pollen grains are on the stigmatic surface. The phenomenon is pollination. What is pollination? Transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma. So pollen grains are, are, are on the stigmatic surface. You just call it pollination. Now what will happen to the pollen grain? It starts growing. What starts growing? The pollen tube. From the pollen grain, there is a tube which is coming out. And this tube grows. Now, how many pollen grains? Any number. It can be any number of pollen grains. But again, just some of you are smart, some of you are smarter, 
similar to that it depends some pollen tube the growth is lesser some pollen tube the growth is even faster so the one which is really smart and starts growing and entering and that's that's the one which succeeds so this pollen tube starts growing and as it is growing the pollen tube the pollen grain when you look at when you look at the pollen grain the pollen grain it will have one vegetative cell one generative cell so there is one vegetative and one generative the vegetative cell will help in the growth of the pollen tube whatever i've drawn the red colored tube it's just by the vegetative cell the vegetative cell will produce the pollen tube i'll call it vegetative now what will happen to the generative one here if i use the word this is generative now what will the generative cell do the generative cell will divide into two male gamete i will just call them male gametes the generative cell will divide into two male gametes if you look at the pollen tube the pollen tubes are carrying you can see you can see one dot here there is an other dot here so there are two dots clearly even here it's shown these are the two male gamete the generative cell is forming two male gamete the pollen tube is just carrying the two male gamete where are they heading to they just coming to what's called as the ovary inside the ovary there is an anatropous ovule there is a ovule so the two male gametes are coming inside now in case if i should explain i'm just looking for a empty space so that i can explain something in case if i should explain okay so for example ima imagine the ovary imagine the ovary and the ovary will be for on top will have the style and stigma what is important to me is ovary inside the ovary there is a anatropous ovule it has two integuments i'm just drawing two lines just to say there are two integuments there is an embryo sac inside very clearly i'm just going with the embryo sac there is an egg cell this is something very important the egg and there are two synergids by the side i call it synergids there is a egg at the center and there are two synergids and at the on the top there are three cells we call it antipodals and at the center there is something called as diploid secondary nucleus i'm using terminologies but i'll just ask you to just recall two one the egg is important i'll just go with the egg the second one diploid secondary nucleus is important dsn so i'm just going with two words now to make your learning simple huh? rather than giving you so many terms there is an egg inside there is a diploid secondary nucleus now what will happen i said there are two uh, male gametes coming imagine this is one another one now what will the male gamete do one male gamete fuses with the egg and other male gamete fuses with this egg will combine with one male gamete will combine with the egg and other male gamete will combine with diploid secondary nucleus since there are two fertilization we just go with the word double fertilization i'm just trying to explain what is double fertilization the word double fertilization clearly indicates there are two fertilization fertilization itself something very important there are two male gamete one male gamete fuses with the egg to form the zygote what is the product it just forms what's called as a zygote and other male gamete fuses with diploid secondary nucleus to form primary endosperm nucleus so there, there are two male gamete one will fuse with the egg cell and other one will fuse with diploid secondary nucleus zygote is formed primary endosperm nucleus is formed hence we call it as double fertilization just to give you an idea of what's double why is the word double so for example there are two male gametes that you should know so what what will the two male gamete do one will fuse with the egg the other one will fuse with diploid secondary nucleus so hence since there are two we just call the phenomenon as double fertilization in angiosperm and just going back to my slide so i i'm just coming back to the fertilization slide 
Yeah, I'm just coming back to the fertilization slide. If you can understand, the pollen tubes are growing and they go into the anatroposovule. There are two male gametes. One is fusing with the egg. The second one is fusing with the diploid secondary nucleus. Since there are two fusion, we call it double fertilization and that's peculiar in angiosperm. You don't see this double fertilization anywhere other than angiosperm. That's why we call it double fertilization in angiosperm. So the final one, I'm just coming to the last slide. So what will happen after fertilization? So after fertilization, the last step would be the formation of what will happen to the ovary? The ovary will form the fruit. What will happen to the ovary? The ovary will be the fruit now. What will happen to the ovule? Uh, the ovule will become the seed. Inside the seeds, whatever you see, they are nothing but ovules. And what is there inside the seed? The seed during germination will give rise to the plant. I can come to the end of the lesson saying that once again a beautiful structure. We started the lesson saying that flowers are beautiful. What do they do? They give rise to something really beautiful. So there is a seed. When you sow the seed or allow it to germinate, there are two seed coats, outer testa and tegmen. They rupture and the radical starts growing first. The radical which grows into the root system. The plumule starts later and the radical establishes in soil. The plumule, it just becomes, gives rise to the green leaves and you get the next progenitor of the next generation. We started with something very beautiful. We are just ending with something really beautiful. So I should say a plant, a new life. So we started with a sex organ. The flower is a sex organ. We just come to the end of the lesson saying that the next generation, a beautiful plant. So we've just learned sexual reproduction. I think I've just given you one or two questions. Why large number of pollen grains in wind pollinated flower? In wind pollinated plants, why a large number? Can some, someone give me an answer? Right, I hear some answers here and there. There is a lot of wastage. There's no proper direction. Wind blows in any direction. There is a lot of wastage. So just to compensate the loss, the number of pollen grains are maximum. So that's one question I have given you. I just want you to just go through the entire. It's just within the limit of two pages in your textbook. Take time, just go through, revise. I think you should be able to follow. I will just pass on all the slides to you. See that you just learn, come prepared for the next class. Namaste children.